Hi everyone, thank you very much for tuning in today. Today's talk is about attacking Terraform environments. By the end of this talk, you'd learn ways to attack and secure your Terraform environments. This talk would cover a lot of things that probably not known before. One thing to say before we start, Terraform by default is not as secure as you would think. You have to put a lot of work to secure it. And what I'm aiming for is by this at by the end of this talk is to learn about all the things that you can know uh, uh, so that you can secure your terraform environments and let's start a little bit about me my name is mazin ahmed i'm an application security and offensive security engineer i founded full hunt it's a security startup that solves the attack surface visibility problem for companies and organizations and also, I'm an occasional bug bounty hunter. I have uh, been acknowledged by Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Zoom, Oracle, and many other companies. And of course, I'm in love with cloud security. Anything related to cloud security, and of course, uh, different things related to security are my passion. And that's why I put the effort into having this research made. The agenda for today, is first we we gonna go over things uh, a background on Terraform. What's Terraform? How does it work? And why do we need to learn about all of this? Why is it important? Attack vectors and scenarios. Attack vectors and scenarios. And of course, the most important part is the demo, which would be really cool. The recommendations at the end and then we would have a room for questions. So first of all, what's infrastructure as code? Back in the years uh, when uh, cloud was starting, was becoming a thing, if someone would like to deploy something, they would go to the console, take their time in deploying their resources for, uh, from the console, and if they would like to do this again and again and maintain that, they would have to log in every single time to do that, which is a bit of a painful thing and does not really scale. That's why infrastructure as code became a popular thing in the um, DevOps and DevSecOps communities. Why? Because you would be able to write uh, all of your resources in the cloud as code, and then you would be able to deploy it many times and at the same time you would allow room for peer review so that the people in your team and different teams would be able to review it it's amazing so yep it allows that part and of course uh, one thing that you can say that once you have this being set up you would be able to run it through uh, CI security scanning for compliance and you can automate many things without really having to have someone to review everything um, uh, being deployed. And of course, when you deploy this in using Git, you would be able to have an archive of everything being deployed. It's just an amazing technology that everyone loves, hopefully. And uh, what's Terraform? Terraform is an open source infrastructure as code software made by HashiCorp around 10 years ago, and uh, users define their code in a language called uh, HCL, or HashiCorp language, and then deployments and, and the entire infrastructure management happens through Terraform. Whenever you write code, you would uh, pass it to a, a Terraform build a binary, and then it will read the Terraform state, uh, state of the current infrastructure, and then it will decide what changes should be done. Why I'm talking about Terraform today instead of all of Apollo me or different uh, or cloud formation or different um, cloud orchestrator because Terraform is the most popular IAC orchestrator on the planet. This year, a couple of months back, they have released uh, Terraform 1.0. The it has been a big thing for everyone that is working on uh, with Terraform. And of course, uh, it passes 100 million downloads. Crazy numbers. Another thing that is cool about Terraform, once you have it, is 
you can write the same uh, infrastructure code and uh, have it integrated with different providers. So you can ha write code that allows you to deploy to AWS or Azure or GCP or anything else. And it's not only these I don't know, six technologies and six providers that are there. They support more than a thousand providers as of today. How, how you would be able to do this? Is as a practitioner or a user, you would write your code, then once it's ready, it would go through Terraform plan, and Terraform plan is uh, like the way that Terraform would be planning your deployment and show you uh, what would be changing. And then it would go through the apply. And once you click on uh, run apply, it would be deploying directly to your cloud provider. The thing is, when you are running apply and uh, plan on apply, this means that you are checking the, the drifts between uh, the current code and what is there on the provider. And if you are applying uh, changes, this means that you have write access on different things on your cloud provider. And who would have this? It would be Terraform. So setting up Terraform would grant it high permissions that allows it to do everything that you need to have it to do. While it sounds curry, it's the default thing. We have to just set it up in a way that could be secure and not rely on the default things and try to think better about it. As I said, with great power comes great responsibility. A single mistake here can lead to the entire compromise of the, uh, the cloud provider or the cloud account. So imagine the, your entire AWS account being held for ransom. Someone would, uh, like if someone compromised it, they would go into your cloud provider. They would be backing up all of your S3 buckets. They would, uh, or may, uh, delete everything. They would have it uh, somewhere else. And then uh, they would ask you for ransom. Imagine this. Ransom is not a thing that you would see only on uh, your uh, internal network or, or, or in your laptops. It's something that can be done also in the cloud. It's, not, it's still not a thing today, but I can imagine that this would be happening in the upcoming years. And as I said about the Terraform uh, states, the way that Terraform works is it would be storing all of the changes and all of the additions that it made in your cloud provider in uh, a file that acts as a database called Terraform state. Every time you do, do a change, it will check it uh, against uh, that file and then would update it whenever there's anything. There are many ways to have your Terraform state being deployed. One thing is you can have it locally. Second way that is, I think, the most common way by uh, everyone that I know is using a, a remote backend of uh, S3 so that you would uh, specify a bucket, you would specify a key, and then which region would you like to have this bucket at on? And then Terraform would be automatically uh, creating this bucket for, uh, would be automatically uh, pushing the, the ch changes in the state file there. And whenever it updates, it would uh, synchronize with that uh, key. So attack number one or thing number one, if you got, uh, if you have uh, get uh, get object permission on the S3 bucket for storing the state file, then you would have access to secrets, access keys, and database credentials. So everything that is being deployed uh, from uh, to, uh, for the organization through Terraform would uh, have a copy of it in the state in the state file. So there's something like uh, an RDS database would have their credentials stored somewhere and that place would have a copy in the state file. Same thing if you create the, an IAM key, uh, access key, then you would have it there or any other secrets that you would define. 
or the provider would be defining uh, for Terraform. So whenever you get access to uh, to an organization and a, a cloud account, try to search for if they have a S3 bucket that looks like it's use uh, it's storing secrets for Terraform. It would have the entire uh, instructions for you to go further in the environment. Another thing is states on Terraform Enterprise. Terraform Enterprise has the, um, Terraform has uh, an enterprise offering called Terraform Enterprise, and uh, the normal op uh, Terraform that people use is a CLI binary that pe uh, that people would be using for deploying uh, infrastructure. But with Terraform Enterprise, you would have uh, SSO team management. States, uh, uh, states management in different ways and configurations and in different ways for your integrations. And Terraform Enterprise is amazing, but still the same problem of storing the states files uh, is, uh, exists on Terraform Enterprise. And how it works is you would uh, tr uh, deploy a Terraform Enterprise as an instance it follows a self-hosted model. Also, they provide a cloud-hosted uh, cloud model that they would be hosting it within uh, an offering called Terraform Cloud. And but let's focus on the uh, on the self-hosted one that you can host in your infrastructure. The states can be stored in many ways: Post, uh, PostgreSQL, AWS RDS. It's uh, it's three mounted disks, same instance desk, and many more. If you get access to any of these uh, places, these places would have access uh, to the state file, and then you can copy this state file, inspect it for secrets, use these secrets for getting a step ahead. Right. Another thing to say, of course, we got, we talked about Terraform Enterprise is deployed as an instance on the AWS account or in the cloud account. And if you compromise an inst a TFE instance, this is the best place for attack uh, persistence. And there are many reasons for that. One, once it gets deployed successfully, no one really touched it. Another thing is upgrades and maintenance really happen. Like, it's not a common thing that uh, an, a DevOps engineer would go in and log and assist it to the server to see different things. Unless something is broken, then that's for our, there is a natural upgrade that would happen. This is the only time that someone would go in and, uh, and try to uh, assist it to this instance. So well, this is one thing to add, and of course, it's uh, if because Terraform Enterprise would have um, permissions to deploy to the cloud to your cloud of environment. You would have uh, the company would have to provide it with proper uh, permissions to deploy uh, to deploy online. So it would have probably admin access to your AWS accounts uh, or any account that is being used for. If you get access to this uh, VM or this instance, then you would have high permissions in doing whatever on the infrastructure. You can create new users, you can uh, backdoor users, you can read uh, buckets, which is uh, something that uh, is not really common, but of course you can do that. And uh, you can do everything. And one thing that is funny here is, let's say that you are in engagement and the and the security team detected that your uh, the database was compromised because of the state files and all. They would ideally go and rotate the database keys. And how would they rotate the keys? They would rotate it through Terraform. That's a, a typical way, uh, or one way actually. 
but if they uh, if they updated it with Terraform, then uh, you would still have the latest keys being synchronized uh, on the Terraform instance, which is really cool. Let me pause for water. And as I said, Terraform Enterprise is, has high permissions and it's not something that you should really put on the internet. But there are hundreds of organizations around the world that have their Terraform Enterprise exposed to the public. If there is a single zero day here, I'm pretty sure this would be a nightmare for all of these companies. If these are filters that you can use, for just checking it out by yourself. Okay, we talked about how you can use this uh, in your advantage with uh, when compromising an, an AWS account that has, uh, that or an AWS uh, user that has access to the S3 bucket that stores the state files. But let's say that you were not really able to compromise the AWS account and you get access to a developer machine and this developer have access to Terraform Enterprise or Terraform Cloud. What things can you do here? Terraform, uh, I have uh, exposed a full dedicated API that can be used for automating functionalities and tasks. This can go from any, uh, everywhere from updating users to provision uh, plans to add comments and everything. And one thing that they have is an API called state version output. And this state version output API allows you to download the state file that you, you, uh, that you would have uh, needed to compromise the, uh, an actual IAM user or all of this. So now if, if it wasn't really possible to do this, you can just uh, go to the API and ask it for your for your state file nicely and it would respond uh, uh, with the actual state file in plain text, which is nice. Of course, this would also contain sensitive data with clear text uh, credentials and everything that could be fun. Okay, going further, a couple months back, Alex K uh, released a, a blog post talking about Terraform Plan RCE. It's a, th uh, it's a problem that Terraform has it for over the years, but it wasn't really talked about uh, uh, within the Terraform communities. And, we, and, this, uh, and this blog post has uh, become a, a, a viral a post about how this attack could be done in uh, a practical way. And they were talking about how you can use uh, an, a malicious provider or an external data source uh, that could allow you to get code execution on the Terraform enterprise or the, the, or the instance that is running Terraform. And this can result in uh, the compromise of the entire infrastructure when someone submits a PR that is not approved. What you're gonna do is, if you find, let's say you set, uh, you landed on a developer machine and this developer machine has, uh, I don't know, GitHub token that allows it to so, uh, to push PR on the account uh, that is being uh, in, the, in the repository that hosts the Terraform code and this one is integrated with Terraform Enterprise like the normal, uh, the, like the normal setup. What would happen here is if the develop if you as a developer check out the a feature branch and then push code and, um, with the malicious payload and or the attack that uh, about that talks about the malicious provider that you're going to uh, talk about, then you will get code execution on that server. You would get shell access. And this is really simple, and of course it's not really intended, and this should never happen in real life, but it has been a fight between usability and security here. 
it's hard to find a way to secure it. At the same time, it's hard to not allow uh, something like external data sources to be used. Uh, Chris, for Alex K, for having this book, uh, blog post uh, written and shared to us. And this is an example of an actual uh, proof of concept. You, you, if you'd like to test it out and you are authorized to test it, go in, copy the code that I have here on my screen. Of course, the slides will be, uh, will, will be public on my website and my blog. And just use this code and then push it in as a feature branch on a ter and a get the repository that is uh, responsible for hosting the Terraform code and then see the magic happens. You would get shell access on that uh, machine. Of course, this is a big problem here. But the thing is, uh, the other uh, platforms are, are also vulnerable. It's not only a problem for Terraform Enterprise. Anything that relies on Terraform build would be vulnerable to this. Uh, uh, Eric Osterman in 2018 tried to introduce a fix and it was rejected. The fix was to use, uh, to, uh, to restrict users from uh, querying the Terraform plan or within Atlantis to only, uh, to only a subset that is being specified. And this would grant security here and could be a temporary fix, but it does not really resolve the, the actual problem from Terraform. Ideally, you should not really be able to run code uh, on Terraform enterprises, uh, enterprise instance and get full access to there or get access into the, the machine or the instance that is running Atlantis. This should, or even the developer machine that runs Terraform plan. This is not the thing, uh, the right thing. All right, moving ahead. We talked about the attack that uh, you can upload, a, you can upload an, an external data source like this one to gain access there. But would it be fun if we can do this in a way that is not really detected from the PR? Let's talk about the evil provider attack. Publishing providers within, Terf uh, within HashiCorp's uh, Terraform is automated. This is made to encourage uh, publishers to push code to Terraform. Uh, but the thing is, trust but verify. We cannot really just push code and have it being uh, trusted uh, to be used by the community and by Terraform without really verifying its content or even having a way to detect attacks here. So let's say, let's say for example, that it, one of these providers or one of these 1,000 providers that are being used by people, it's not only these uh, six or eight providers, are, have been compromised and they have been backdoored. And we're gonna talk about how. And if this happens and someone just say Terraform init and Terraform plan, what would happen is the attacker would be compromising the company. It would be chaos. But, you know, I don't want to have this being as a theoretical attack that does not really happen in the real world and someone is discussing it in public. I would like to show an actual proof of concept about this attack from zero to the end. So let's start. First, let's try to set up a provider. Uh, I set up a new uh, GitHub uh, account. I call it Evil Terraform. Of course, I didn't want to use my uh, my personal uh, GitHub account because I know it may get suspended. We're gonna talk about this one in a bit. And then I developed a simple provider. And this provider was pushed into even Terraform slash Terraform provider E. Of course, this is my picture. Anyone can know that this, the code that I have and then I backdoored this uh, provider with this code. 
this is a simple Terraform. Uh, this is a simple uh, uh, provider that would grant me uh, a reverse CCP shell upon the execution to my server. And then I pushed it to uh, to the Terraform registry, and it was accepted. Uh, it was approved. I had my category as cloud automations because it automates my hacking here. And I will show you in a bit what happened. Once I had the provide, uh, they're being approved by Terraform. I I I made a PR to push it uh, to somewhere. And it looked like this. It's just the, sa the same way that we would be pushing providers in uh, our companies. And now the fun part is the demo. Popping a shell in Terraform Cloud, hosted by Terraform. Uh, sorry, hosted by HashiCorp. This is app to terraform.io. Right, and you would wonder from here is how is the detection here? Probably in a in a well organized uh, environment that is running a good EDR solution or antivirus solution, this attack would be prevented or detected. But it wasn't the case. I I pu I pushed the provider that I uh, built into VirusTotal and no provider really detected that. And back to the attack that we showed here. Pushing the provider th that grants me a risk CCP shell got executed uh, correctly within HashiCorp infrastructure, which is really bad. Uh, imagine what could happen afterward. I haven't really exploited this. Further, I only stopped at this uh, part, and I tried my best to make it as obvious uh, to the security team to see how the team response would be like. And before I uh, I I continue here, I wanna say that this attack is against the terms of use by HashiCorp. Running this in an account may result in account suspicion. So how was the security team response? Within hours of my exploitation, they detected the evil provider attack and contacted me directly to chat about my findings. And then we discussed various ideas and thoughts to introduce a fix from, for the thing that was presented here. And uh, HashiCorp uh, informed me that they are really thinking about ways into having this uh, being mitigated in their, uh, for their customers. For the time being, there is no patch, there is no fix to introduce, and there is no way to prevent this. I appreciate the uh, HashiCorp's uh, efforts in handling and analyzing the research. One thing to add is I was planning to uh, to um, to make the responsible disclosure the next day of my tests. And before even going to the next day, they were uh, the ones who were contacting me. And I really appreciate them being this proactive. 
Uh, one thing to add here is we are also uh, thinking about uh, starting their uh, bug bounty program. At the, at the current time, they don't have a bug bounty program, but this is one thing that they also are planning to have. Now, going to the recommendations. First, be careful. There is, like, you would have hard times in maintaining a secure terraform environment. So, being careful is my main recommendation here. Another thing is, I don't know, why is it like this? Okay, uh, another thing is when when using SV as a remote backend, try to have uh, a, a bucket access policy to prevent uh, other users other than Terraform instance to have access to your instance. This way you can uh, prevent uh, prevent uh, like unauthorized access in certain ways. Of course, uh, there is a bypass. There are bypasses for this uh, uh, solution where if you have another user that have access to modify the the bucket access policy for this bucket, then they can delete the access bucket policy and then they can access the bucket here. But at least if you can uh, use this as, a, as a, a protection, this would be a good way. Another thing is to continually update and review your Terraform instance. It can be easily forgotten in the noise and if there is an attacker or an actor that lands on your Terraform instance, as uh, like mentioned earlier, this is a great place for attack persistence. So it can be easily abused badly here, and then it can be easily for defenders to forget about it. So yeah. Another thing is, be careful in permitting people to have write access, even feature like feature branch access for your uh, Terraform repository, because it can lead to direct code execution uh, and there is no way to patch it. I'm waiting for a patch to happen. We, uh, HashiCorp uh, and I were talking about uh, way, different ways to detect the attack. Meanwhile, the actual um, uh, patch is there but it's just ways to detect it. There is no way to prevent it at the moment. Another thing is to maintain a, a Terraform instance in an isolated VPC that no one really accesses it on the internet. Do not be exposed to the internet. This is bad. The next zero day that would happen, someone would scan the internet and probably compromise your organization because of this mistake, and it would be bad. And I think this would be lastly, state files are sensitive, like they contain a lot of data from database passwords to SSL keys, uh, uh, sorry, SSL certificates, access keys, treat them as sensitive data. And of course, a good idea is to set up CI check to detect uh, rogue telephone providers. That this would aid in the exploitation discovery whenever someone is trying to exploit your uh, Terraform setup. This is one thing to add as a defensive measure. One thing that uh, HashiCorp uh, security team uh, uh, asked me to add is the Terraform cloud security model. This is a document that talks about different ways that uh, that you can use for threat modeling your Terraform Cloud security, while at the same time it, uh, it can apply for your Terraform enterprise uh, setup. And now we are reaching to the end of the talk. Final thoughts. Terraform is amazing. I love Terraform. It brings several security features when implementing uh, IAC with Terraform, but still with great power comes great responsibility protect your Terraform environment. Stay safe and set up persistent monitor like Full Hunt to discover shadow IT, misconfigurations, and mistakenly exposed services. Of course, it would not really work out for all of the Terraform attacks we talked here. Uh, but yeah, just one thing to add here. And lastly, the questions. 